of the deaths of these people, 40 people, but they never even came to trial. It never even came to trial. Where's the outrage over the death of people of color? And that will be my conversation when and if I ever get the chance with President-elect Obama. Because he says you gotta keep the death penalty, he says, for especially heinous crimes to allow the full outrage of the community to be expressed. Well, what full outrage? And I had noticed that when I moved in St. Thomas. When white people were killed, their picture was in the paper, it was always on the front page. When people of color were killed, you were looking if you could find on page 30. Is it possible that we don't have the same outrage of the death of some of our citizens as we do about others? And that's not just race, it's class. If a homeless person is murdered on the streets of Buffalo tonight, or any city that has the death penalty in the state, can you picture the DA going on the news saying, one of our valuable citizens was killed last night, they're going to seek the ultimate penalty? It has a lot to do with what's the status of the victim. Supreme Court got us in all this trouble because they gave a criteria that nobody knows how to apply. They said the death penalty is to be applied, get this now, not for ordinary murders, but for the worst of the worst. Anybody here know what an ordinary murder is? Well, you killed my brother, but it wasn't like with a whole room full of people, so I guess that was ordinary. Or he wasn't a policeman. What's ordinary? Only the worst of the worst. So how about this? A 14-year-old girl is taken into the woods by three young men, and she is raped and her throat is slashed and she's left to bleed to death in the woods. A 14-year-old girl, does it get any worse than that? And her name is Virginia Smith, and the three young men who murdered her were brought to trial. Not only did they not get the death penalty, two of them didn't get life sentences, but young Virginia Smith was black, and the three kids were white, and the daddies knew the DA. We can't entrust the state with, um, take, you know, with death. We can't. We got to take death off the table. We can't have it. I learned from this as I go along. Second book, Death of Innocence, I'm talking about a company of two people I believe are innocent. When you read the story, you're going to know more than the jury ever knew that sentenced them to death. Because you're going to know about the evidence that was withheld. You're going to know about people like Steve Watson, who was a jailhouse informer who lied. You're going to know about all the things the jury are. They sit there, they just like us. If you can't get truth at trial, you can't then even have what you need to be able to be the arbiters of life and death. It is so broken. There are 130 people now who have come off a death row because they were wrongly put there. It's a broken, broken system. And so I learned. Didn't know all this in the beginning. Knew I was visiting this man. Then knew I had come over and begun to see the agony of the victim's family. Can we be, when we take the gospel of Jesus, and here we're in a Franciscan university. A Franciscan university where we have Francis of Assisi, who had been in the military, who had been taken as a prisoner of war, one of these stupid little battles between the nobles, and he gets sick and he almost dies. And then he has this moment of saying, I'm not going to fight these silly little wars. I'm going to serve Christ. And he comes out and he becomes Francis of Assisi. He was such a radical, he shook everybody up. His daddy was a very successful businessman in Assisi. And here's the son stripping off all his clothes and he's standing buck naked in front of the bishop saying that he's going to devote his life to Christ. I mean, they're going, hey, whatever his daddy's name was, Bernardo or whatever, hey, your son's kind of lost it. Did you know he's standing buck naked in the public square in front of the bishop saying he's devoting his life to Christ? He's not doing the military anymore? What, what, my son, what? And we picture in another age, oh, but they must have thought differently. Uh-uh, bring it home, bring it home. A son, like the son of Philip Morris, it says, Dad, tobacco and nicotine addicts people and I'm not going to be part of this and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to follow in your footsteps in this company. I mean, 
to sons standing up to fathers because of matter of conscience, Francis of Assisi. Jesus. Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus was all about forgiveness. How did we so quickly lose that and interpret it as Jesus is all for justice. You kill, you die. An eye for an eye. Everybody quotes an eye for an eye. They never quote Jesus' word. You've heard it said an eye for an eye. But I say to you, because Jesus had another way of loving that no one can stay our enemy long. Do we believe that? Or do we believe, well, the love thing can only go so far Then we got to talk about tough love. We got to talk about justice. We got to talk about fighting fire for, with fire. They kill, they die. It's the only way to stop these people. If you get it about the death penalty, you're going to get it about Iraq. And you're going to get it about that paradigm that says the only way we can be safe is to kill the enemy. Target the enemy, dehumanize them, they're not human the way we are. When we do it on our own soil, it prepares us to be able to do it in Iraq. To be able to do it with Muslim people and say they, they're extremists, they don't think like us. we got to kill them because they're going to kill us. Target the enemy, dehumanize the enemy, kill the enemy is the only way to peace. We are a young country. We've been used to sending in the military from the beginning to try to solve our social problems. We enslaved people from Africa. We sent the cavalry out to tear down the sweat lodges and to herd Native American people on the reservations where they die. And we came into the military very, very soon. Get it about the death penalty. It's a military solution to a social problem. It's about rendering somebody defenseless and killing them. And that's what we got to do. It's tough, but we got to do it. And Jesus executed by the state. Can you imagine? Just imagine this little scenario. If Jesus had whispered to Peter, James, and John in that agony in the garden, fellas, come here. If they kill me, the way you will honor me is to get justice for me, get vengeance for me. And when you shed their blood in my name, I will be honored. Avenge my death. How the acts of the apostles would read. There's Caiaphas getting knocked off. Then they assassinate Pontius Pilate. Let's go after all the people of the high priest Caiaphas. The killing that would have begun for 300 years, we followed the way of the nonviolent Jesus. And then what happened to us? Well, read the book Constantine's Sword. Read when, for the first time, we held up the cross as a symbol of victory in war. Read what happened to us. Because now we live in 2008. And the gospel of Jesus is longing to live in its pure form, just like a Francis of Assisi had to grapple with it. we got to grapple with it, too. And what are we for? What are we for? And I descended to all of this with this man, Patrick Sonier, and he was the first. And in the end, I know that to follow Jesus, we have to put our arm around the victim's family, and that to follow Jesus, we got to put our arm around the perpetrator and say he's worth more than the worst thing he ever did. He has a dignity that must not be taken from him. And we should not torture and kill people. We have a way to defend ourselves from dangerous people because we have prisons. And in the end, I'm with this man when they killed him. And he was trying to, we had prayed, we had Two and a half years, I have his Bible, I have the Psalms he underlined, Psalms I never noticed before, like Psalm 31, Oh God, they plot to take my life, but you are my rock, on you I stand. And then we're in the death house, and when we were making the movie, Susan Saranna kept saying, this is the most surreal thing, because the tiles are polished, everybody's going about their jobs, it feels like life. And then the electrician's coming in to test the chair. And then the witnesses are following in. Then in another room, they got the press and the media, and they're serving them sandwiches and coffee and, and drinks while they're waiting to go do their little job as the press. Then the associate wardens start coming in dressed in three-piece suits. We're getting ready for an event tonight. And Pat kept looking through the metal door with the mesh screen 